Can we make Shakespeare accessible to anyone who speaks English? That's a project that I've been working on for a while. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going to compare a reading that I'll do of a, a speech in Julius Caesar by Shakespeare as Shakespeare wrote it, or at least to some degree, as it is in the general folio that we all have access to um, anywhere. Anybody can pick up a book, go on the internet, look at Project Gutenberg, and get this exact speech with this exact grammar, with this, this exact spelling, and these exact words. This is the Shakespeare as it's known today. And then, after I do a reading of this somewhat short speech, I think it's like a minute and a half, two minutes to do the speech, I'm going to give you the same speech, but in modernized English. And that is with the goal of having elevated, beautiful language, but in the language as as we speak it. Now, I want to give credit real quick, where credit is due. This whole project is given to me by a friend or recommended and suggested by a friend through a linguist named John McWhorter. John McWhorter has been talking for many years about the importance of translating Shakespeare into modern English. His argument is essentially that Russians and people in other countries that are not native English speakers the normal everyday Russian probably has a better understanding and experience of Shakespeare than does the modern English-speaking American, for instance. And the reason is that when you, you take Shakespeare, they're translating it in Russian so that a Russian speaker can understand it. But because it's written in English, although it's more late or middle English, depending on who you ask, then it's much more difficult to understand. There's um, anachronisms. There's old. There's just phrases that we don't use anymore. There's been 400 years of language and word change, where words mean very different things. And then there's just the way that we hear words today, like the way that I'm speaking and the way that the the syntax or the word order that I'm using, including the vocabulary that is a generic, even an elevated, beautiful, extended vocabulary, is different today than it was in 1599. Okay, so this is the project. This is the basic idea of what we're trying to accomplish with this reading of this speech in Julius Caesar by Shakespeare. So I'm going to give you a real quick context. If you haven't read Shakespeare, if you haven't read Julius Caesar, that's fine. You're still going to understand what I'm trying to accomplish here. And my goal, my hope with this whole project is to open up for more people William Shakespeare's work, because my belief is that the it's not about these esoteric words that nobody knows or the phrases people can't understand, but really the core of Shakespeare, what makes Shakespeare so long lasting and great is the depth of his characters, the intriguing plots, the storytelling overall, and the beautifying of the language. And I believe we can still beautify the language given the context and the background and the help from Shakespeare, but in modern English that you can understand almost as easily as you can with me. It'll still be a stretch and you'll see what I'm talking about, but you should be able to understand the words. Okay, so let's go into the reading. So first off, this is from Act 2, Scene 1. So this is the very beginning of the scene if you don't know the story of Julius Caesar, basically Julius Caesar gets ex- gets assassinated in Act Three, and that's and then the f- uh, final two acts, four and five, is the fallout from that. So in Act Two, at the very beginning, Brutus, who is one is the protagonist, he's the main, usually considered the main character, even though he's not named as the play. It's called Julius Caesar or the tragedy of Julius Caesar. Brutus comes from one of the oldest families in Rome. This is old nobility. And he comes from a family 
that had thrown out and killed the kings of the old Roman kingdoms. And they killed the kings and they ushered in the era of the republics. And now he's being asked, or he was asked the night before, a few nights before, by his friend Cassius, who's also a nobleman. So these are all noblemen doing things to other noblemen. Cassius asked Brutus, essentially, what is his take on Caesar taking the crown? So this is an era of Roman Republic. And now Caesar is on the verge of potentially taking the crown. And Brutus comes from a line, a lineage of killing kings. And now the question is, are we going to let, for Brutus, is he going to let Caesar become king and just kind of give up on the republic that he loves? Or is he going to do something about it? So this, this little speech is nicknamed, it must be by his death. It's seen, uh, you know, act two, scene one. And it's where Brutus is contemplating this dilemma. Should he kill Caesar, his friend, by the way, this is important. It's his friend. He cares about Caesar. He loves Caesar. Or should he uh, do what is right or honorable in his view, which is to save the Republic in his mind by killing Caesar? That's the action. Okay, so that's the context. Now I'm going to give you a reading. Um, I'm not, you know, acting is not my, I'm not the pinnacle of acting, but I'm going to do my best to give you a little taste of this. Okay, it must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to spurn at him, but for the general. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature, there's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the adder, and that craves wary walking. Crown him that, and then I grant we put a sting in him that at his will he may do danger with. The abuse of greatness is when it disjoins remorse from power. And to speak truth of Caesar, I have not known when his affections swayed more than his reason. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the utmost round, he then under the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may. Then, lest he may, prevent. And since the quarrel will bear no color for the thing he is, fashion it thus, that what he is, augmented, would run to these and these extremities. And therefore think him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would as his kind grow mischievous and kill him in the shell. Okay, there's my best Brutus. Well, I won't say that's my best. I think I could do better, but <laughs> I hope you got something out of that. Now, I bet all the words made sense. That speech in particular, you probably do get a sense of what he's saying. This is not the most complicated Shakespearean speech to translate, but I still want you to get a sense of the difference here and see if it strikes you, if it hits you a little bit different, this updated, uh, this modernized version where we're, we're switching up some of the language, we're switching up a little bit of the syntax, and we're making it uh, understandable and more accept accessible without losing the gravitas. That's what we don't want to lose. So this is the modern version. It must be by his death. And for my part, I know no personal cause to strike at him, but for the general good. He would be crowned. How that might change his nature that's the question. It is the bright day that brings forth the serpent and that demands careful stepping. Crown him that, and then I grant we give him a sting, which at his will he may do damage with. The abuse of greatness is when it separates compassion from power. And to speak truth of Caesar... I have not known when his emotions swayed more than his reason. 
but it's a common proof that humility is young ambition's ladder to which the climber turns his face upward. But once he reaches the utmost rung, he then turns his back upon the ladder, gazes into the clouds, scorning the base steps by which he did ascend. So may Caesar. Then, lest he may, we must prevent it. And since the coral will bear no color for what he is now, shape it thus, that what he is magnified would lead to these and other extremities. And therefore, consider him as a serpent's egg, which hatched would by its nature become dangerous. And so we must kill him in the shell. Okay. So those are my two comparisons. I'd love to hear from you about what you think of those two. Now, I, I'm going to try to do some more of these because I think there's even more stark examples of differences between the original and the modern. And there's many that we can see a, a lot of analogies and metaphors that are dead to us now. We don't have a lot of that in here you know, the, there's some simple changes like it is the bright day that brings forth the adder. I think if you're listening to that in the audience, you might know what an adder is off the top of your head. I think most people probably do. But again, part of what I think is important for understanding Shakespeare is it's not, oh, Shakespeare used adder necessarily, but can we find something that in this long speech will help the audience grasp it immediately? That's the thing is I want them to see it immediately. And I think the change to serpent made sense. Um, you know, and that c demands careful st uh, stepping versus wary walking. I think, I don't think anybody would be confused about wary walking, but again, in the, the midst of all of the language, the more literal careful stepping, I think is helpful in that. The, I think the biggest change in this particular speech, and there's little changes throughout, but the biggest change is probably this, these lines here, but tis, this is the original. But tis a common proof that lowliness is young ambition's ladder, whereto the climber upward turns his face. But when he once attains the utmost round, round, which is supposed to be wrong, right? He then unto the ladder turns his back, looks in the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. So Caesar may, then lest he may prevent. Okay. Now, I changed that to, but, but it's a common proof that humility is young ambition's ladder, to which the climber turns his face upward, but once he reaches the utmost rung, he then turns his back upon the ladder, gazes into the clouds, scorning the base degrees by which he did ascend. Instead of saying scorning the base degrees, we say scorning the base steps. This makes it a little bit clearer to an audience what exactly is going on, especially if they get lost along the way. So these little changes, you know, then lest he may, we must prevent it. That's from my translation. Verse then lest he may prevent. I think if you are listening to then lest he may prevent, you can still get that. You know, there's, there's lots of little things that I'm trying to do in this new translation to simply not lose the tenor of the gravity and the poetry, but also not lose the audience. And my experience in listening to Shakespeare and loving Shakespeare is the what John McWhorter calls the fog. And many of us, I think, experience this. Again, even people who really appreciate Shakespeare, that as we're listening, we're listening to something so alien to us in many ways that we kind of forget what we're trying to get across. And we're reliant completely on the intonation of the actor, the gestures of the actor, and the context to try to get some grasp of what's happening. And often, because actors are, and, and the directors are trying to truncate and, you know, not lose the audience, there's even a speeding up that goes on sometimes of the language, so that it makes it even more difficult sometimes to really grasp what's happening. Okay, so that's what I have for you today. I wanted to get your thoughts on this original by Shakespeare, and then a modern translation. And we're going to get some more of that going soon. I have a whole script that's modernized so that anybody can understand or at least have a better chance of really understanding it without losing, again, that full gravitas. Okay, thank you, and I'll see you next time.